The Hale Varsity Radio Saturday Morning Show. Strap yourselves in. Here are your hosts, Chris Schmidt. Y'all don't even know he was a virgin until he's 28, and now, roll tide. And Mark Cranach. Time has come for someone to put his foot down. And that foot is me. Welcome to it. Weekend editions here. It's Hale Varsity Radio. We're presented by Currency for all your equipment financing needs. Go Currency. Chris Schmidt, Elijah Herbal, Mark Cranach in his Husker Den, or dare I say living room. Hopefully you're doing all right this morning. And a lot of buzz about Nebraska and recruiting. A trip down to Arizona by nine assistants. Basketball on our mind. Of course, Nebraska, Maryland. Oscar baseball got to be outdoors yesterday and a big matchup down at Arrowhead with uh, the AFC championship game. We'll cover all of it here this morning on Hale Varsity. Numbers to get in 466-3776-800-825-5865. Can watch the show as well as hear it uh, every uh, Saturday morning, 7 to 9 on ESPN Lincoln. But if you're bumping around, uh, great on the radio. If you're on your phone or tablet, ESPN Lincoln Facebook, ESPN Lincoln Twitter, the Hale Varsity YouTube channel, and always follow us with Hale Varsity Radio on Twitter at H Varsity Radio. Chris Schmidt at Schmidt underscore radio, Elijah Herbal at Herbal Essence. Someday, Mark Cranach. We'll return to at Mark Skurs on Twitter. Fellas, good to see you this morning. How are we doing? I like I like your uh, green hoodie today, man. That looks that is awesome. I, Thank I like you. That. It's it's a uh, it's a dark dark uh, shade of green. Actually, it's a Christmas gift from our friends at Alpha. This is black shirt black. Elijah's got more oh. of the hunter green going, but that's a beautiful oh, purple okay. bill you have going. I didn't know you flipped over to K-State. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if it's – and this is blue, by the way. Yeah, yeah, is there some kind of bit that we're going on here? <laughs> Mark, sure. Mark goes, love the green sweatshirt, and Schmitty goes, it's black. And Schmitty goes, I love the purple hat, and it's blue. <laughs> no, I know. I know. There's some we're bit that's going on right over my head. We're this this morning. <laughs> that's yeah. our new thing. That's our new mm-hmm. thing, I guess. I, anybody still excited about Husker hoops? I feel bad. I no, feel bad. we're not. No, I, I, le- I legitimately feel bad for Fred Hoiberg. Like he brought in some dogs. He brought in some defensive guys. Gary and Bandamel will d you up, man. They are good. They're mm. good defensively, and they're just hurt, and they're not going to play. And so Fred's going to get rolled again, <laughs> and it's like, damn, <laughs> again, again. You know, it's just it's going to happen again. They're going to get rolled again. They can't. Come on, they're not. No, they're not, it's they're not doing they, anything the rest of the year. No, they. they I'm going to uh, call that right now. Sorry. So, so they so they uh, they lose out. Is that where you're going? Because it's highly I don't probable. Know about lose well, yeah, well, they they going to win out. <laughs> I'll tell you that. <laughs> <laughs> like um, that much is pretty obvious, but they uh, they just can't get a break. They can't get a break. And I, I don't know what that – I mean, what does that do for Fred? Look, they, I mean, he hasn't won at all here, right? Like, No, but at least you've seen – This is his best year. You've seen like a change in – 500 be- still. You, you've seen a change in behavior, though, right? You've seen – Totally. You've, totally. You've seen a change in behavior, and I think that's step one. And if you're Nebraska – and the, this fan base likes this team. They're hard – they're as hard to watch offensively as any team he's had – but it's a different hard to watch. They just can't make shots. It's not for lack of effort or selfishness. That's plagued his previous three teams. They didn't give a damn on defense, and they were pretty selfish on offense. This year, they try and share the ball. They just can't throw a uh, throw it in the ocean from a boat a lot of times, right? I mean, uh, which is kind of the sport. You know, it's kind of. The no, I know you got to make you, <laughs> you got to make shots. If I if I'm like, trying. He's good at football. He just doesn't really know how to tackle anybody like to tackle. or run yeah. with it. <laughs> you know, he doesn't like, like contact. Well, I know. It's like, well, <laughs> that's kind of football, man. 
Oh, he's crazy. Uh, he's good at soccer. He just can't really kick that. No, he's just got two way. left feet. I mean, <laughs> you know? it is what it is. Now, you can't listen. score in hoops, man. Well, and, right. and the thing is, it's, it's like it's a Fred Hoiberg coach basketball team, too. Like, all Husker fans are expecting like 90 plus point performances from Fred Hoiberg teams, and he got yeah. hired. Now we're four years down the road, and it was, well, we had to adjust. We had to go defensive for the Big Ten, and we're, we're yet to put together a squad that actually looks like they have a competent offense. Which makes you wonder, like those Iowa State teams, did he just like stumble into some really good players? And well, he that he just kind of <laughs> he had he had NBA yeah. guys. He had he had yeah. two right. to three NBA guys. Now his system yeah. works. They just have not found personnel <laughs> to execute it. And at least he he shifted to a defensive mindset. A little tribute to Doc Sadler. I mean, that's what Husker basketballs resembled this year, where they travel the defense and, and that's kept them in a lot of ball games. They, they out grit you, which Nebraska fans will take. Listen, um, if I'm Trev, listen, my waistline would be great and I'd be in incredible shape, but from a thought process, <laughs> uh, if I, if I'm Trev, I'm like, look, he's, he's not, I like how you fat shamed yourself. This I, yeah. Yeah. You gotta do it because ahead. you know, I just, it, I look like a giant green vegetable in this sweatshirt. Um, <laughs> you do. But you no, I mean, he, purple. You, you, right. You've seen the change and I think you have, look, Gary can come back. You've got uh, Jamarcus that I think has a lot of upside. Uh, I know it's one game four for eight from three point land. And then you got Denim Dawson. I mean, you have, and then Breidenbach, you have some pieces on this roster. Yeah. What's their jump projection like next year? No idea but you don't want to risk that. And you really totally want to reset. I know it's tough to watch. I know it could be even more draining if they win one or two more games, but I think you have to take into context the situation and acknowledge that he shifted it. I think you you had him take another pay cut or say, Hey, we want to keep you around. Uh, but we're gonna we're gonna down to, Fred, Fred's Fred's, down to twenty two bucks an hour. Yeah, Fred's, <laughs> like Fred's, McDonald's employees in California. Fred's Fred's down That's to a hundred and a half a year. <laughs> I'm kidding, but no, I, I mean he, I think he wants. Think about Fred right now where he's at. You leave Iowa State for the NBA, you go to the NBA, and it's nothing but injuries there. Yeah, and well, I, and, and listen, then you land in in Nebraska as this. Oh wow, we got Fred. And it's not worked out. And you you had missteps and you relied on the wrong information, which was your call with Abdel Massey and, and how they went about building a roster. Talent, yes, but buy-in, no. And you've you've changed that. So give me another year, no matter how bad it hurts, towards the end of this year with Fred. That's where I'm at. I mean, it's and it's reasonable, but I think you should see how the rest of the year unfolds too. Are you still feeling that way if, if, not saying it will happen, but look, Northwestern kind of pulled away from Nebraska. I mean, it's like a couple years in a row. A, Northwestern's a, a bubble slash NCAA tournament team this year, though. Well, uh, yeah. A, a bubble team, not, not D- Duke, right? Like no. they're, they're, they're a bubble team. And they, That's better, kinda, it's, it's better than past Northwestern teams drilling you by 13 at home. Well, but, but what I'm saying is that's that's been happening, right? No, like Northwestern has rolled up on the set under Hoiberg and just drilled you, like whether wh- whatever your roster looks like, you're like okay, that, that's probably that's not great. That maybe should be better. Look, I get it for this year, and you do feel bad because I do feel like he pieced together a team that you know was kind of playing ball like most Husker fans would hope they would. Which is you, you, you rebound, Together. you play some defense. Yeah, you're you're unselfish. You move the ball. You get you just give yourself a chance, basically. And they and look when all when their starting five was there, which the, the starting five did not play together a lot this year. They probably miss half their games with each other around there, mm-hmm. with Walker being out early, right? With Greasel missing some time, uh, b- between Gary Greasel, Walker. And um, Bandamel, and then I guess who would be? Oh, Kada's missed a bunch of time, mm-hmm. right? Like the the team has just had horrible luck health wise this year, and I bet you Trev's going to take that into account, and I think we all should too. 
But at the same time, it's year four. You shouldn't do be, right. be, be like, reliant on, well, you know, point. it didn't happen this year because of injury. Where were the previous three years? Well, and, and you wonder if like, is this just part of Fred's trajectory? Like a, a bunch of things are in, entering my mind here. So if you're Trev, are you like, you, you heard what he said about what he wants in a football coach with some, which I'm assuming that's what he wants at all coaches, right? He wants grinders, you know, people that are really getting after it. Um, people that have a, a real defined kind of way about how they want to go about winning. Um, and that way needs to resonate and reflect Nebraska, right? Which is, uh, you know, probably for, uh, Probably for basketball, defense, rebounding, and, you know, great. If you figure out some way to score. It doesn't have to be threes. It doesn't have to be, you know, but it's defense and rebounding primarily, I think, is what would resonate the best here. So, like, is Fred a grinder? I, that's a, I don't know that answer. But is, is, this, is this more a situation like a Bo Pelini where Bo, super promising, had some incredible years – Right. Did some really good things. But then at some point, his career just kind of it. You know, well, I see it more like a a Bill Callahan situation, Mark, where it's no one doubts that Bill Callahan is a very, very bright football mind. No one doubts that Fred Hoiberg is a very smart basketball mind. The question with Callahan was, was he a fit for Nebraska? And after a couple of years, we all kind of saw it. You know what? No, the the. This is not the Nebraska style that we want to play football. And that's, I think, the question with Hoiberg right now is no one doubts how smart he is as a basketball mind, and no one doubts that he's a good basketball coach. The question right now is, four years in, have we seen anything that's shown that he's a fit for Nebraska? And by year four, the, the one thing that you saw that could have been a fit was the fact that he adapted how he wants to play basketball in order to make it fit the Big Ten. But... The detractor is, you know what? It took him three years to realize what it's going to take to win in the Big Ten. It took him years to to figure out what his roster needs to be to win in the Big Ten. And you sit here and you go, is, is that a guy who deserves to get another year? Maybe. Because with, with Callahan, he continued playing his system. But Hoiberg is, you know, flipping up to a, a, a more Big Ten-esque system. And the question is, is another year going to get him across the line, or is it just time to cut your losses and find a guy who's a better fit for Nebraska? And that's the question that Trev's going to have to wrestle with over the next month and a half or so. I think I think Fred showed that he's able to fit stylistically into the league. Yeah. He just has to do better at building depth and getting more execution. If it was still the same three-on-three type offense and no defense – with minimal toughness, then it's not even a question. You move on, but he's shown that he's able and willing to change. But but that's the big that's that's the biggest thing for me. I listen. I I don't know. I don't know that it's going to be optically anything to. I mean, there's there nothing the buyout. <laughs> sure. Well, there yeah. is the buyout. That, that, that but, that's but, a real factor here, right? Like there. Is he going to drop another ten mil or whatever it is to for someone not to coach here? Like, where's my check? I'll do that. That's cool. Sure. You well, and, and and Matthew chimes in a couple of thoughts. Fred's never finished in the top half of the league. Obviously, uh, Tim was at least fifth before he got whacked. And there's just a reality of what Nebraska basketball's been, and it doesn't have to be like that. Do you? eject or do you give him a little bit more time and I, I side on on time and also you look at just what's being spent here uh, on athletics I mean you've just rehauled football do you give it a little more time and, and let that buyout mark decrease by another season and and give him uh, a fifth season well I think the, the 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 question is can Fred Hoiberg build or continue to build a roster that's Big Ten centered because there's four guys. I think so. I think I think he can. There's four guys on the roster this season. That I think that are already made for the Big Ten. You look at Greasel. You look at Walker, Gary, and Bandamel. You had four guys that at least fit what you need to be in the Big Ten. You lost half of those guys, and you sit here and you go, "Why is yeah. there not more than four guys on a roster by year four that fit the mold you need to be in for the Big Ten? But the question is, is is with as fluid as rosters can be in college basketball and the, the modern college athletics. Can he turn that around and can he get that number higher than four next season? That, that's the question that Trev has to wrestle with. 
I think Denim Dawson also shows potential to be one of those guys. Uh, he's not there. He's, he's, kind not, of he's wild. not 100 there yet, but yes. Yeah, he's kind of wild offensively, obviously, but he's he's solid defensively. He's very athletic. I can see him being a you know seven point six rebound type dude by the time he's a junior, right? Maybe getting a couple steals and just being that you know making the dives on the floor that kind of guy right so i, I can see him being one of those jamarcus lawrence jur- jury's still out i think he's playing a little earlier than he would have expected ramel lloyd's red shirting don't really know tommy naga is kind of this random x factor that <laughs> th- thinks keeps he won the national title yeah, yeah. Keeps he won the while. national title after every bucket <laughs> i love it um someone's but, gonna put him into a backboard i mean they're just gonna someone's gonna finally lose it come big turn big 10 tournament time and some giant down in the paint is going to just take him out, go into the rim. Well, it, or, no, or it might be an official. I don't know yet. You know, what's funny about, about the basketball team too. And just about the state of, of uh, basketball at Nebraska is like, dude, there, there seriously is no excuse of why you can't get it done there. I, I don't, I don't even want to hear. I'm not, I'm not entertaining that discussion anymore. Cause all you have to do is look 50 miles up the road. Right, so don't, don't give me oh nobody wants to play in the middle of the country. Creighton's having no problem pulling in some dudes and playing in the Big East and competing. And they're, they're, well, how about they're Kansas fine. State a year yeah. later? Yeah, K State, Iowa State, right? Like if, so, everybody around Nebraska has figured it out, right? But Nebraska somehow is you know precluded from having a successful basketball team. That's come on. And and I think in the past you might be able to say, well, the commitment wasn't there, and that might have been true. Your facilities weren't weren't as good. That's not the case anymore. Your facilities are top notch, upper echelon, top fifty probably, maybe higher than that, in terms of the practice facility plus Pinnacle Bank Arena. So facilities isn't a problem, right? Overall, like sort of money isn't a problem. Competing in the Big Ten, that's not a problem, right? It's it, like don't give me that. You're you're paying you're paying for. I mean, Hoiberg's not like bottom of the barrel in terms of salary. It's all there. It's all there. Well, you know, you, you, you got to have a coach and a vision, and you got to be able to put it all together. Well, you've got you still have high high name value with your head coach. Yeah. Well, I mean, he's respected yeah. around the college and pro basketball world. It just needs to be delivered on court. Well, Guys, the, 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 the problem you have, just quickly before I know you want to flip to football, is that you're always going to have the 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 the. Uh, the reciprocal problem of what Kentucky has. Kentucky, you know, with the football team, you always live in the shadow of the basketball team. It's the opposite at Nebraska. No matter what recruit you bring in here, no matter what coach you bring in here to Nebraska, you're always going to live in the shadow of the football team. And and I think that's, when you talk about a potential Husker basketball curse, that's got to be a huge factor that we're talking about here. The fact that you're never going to be the number one thing on campus, no matter how good that Husker basketball team is, you're never going to be the number one thing on campus. And that's a problem you're always going to have to deal with just as you look at this Husker basketball team as a whole. I don't think you use it as a, as a problem. You use it as a solution. I mean, that's, I mean, Tim Miles was great with some of the higher profile recruits. I mean, I think that sold Roby uh, when he made his visit, it was, it might've been uh, that Miami game in 2014. You bring the recruits in, in September to a, to a football atmosphere and then kind of show them what basketball can be as well. And to your point, Mark, the facilities is, is not an issue. Uh, Don says Danny Nee. Danny Nee had in-state talent that's been incredible. That's been uh, high Nebraska's level. Nebraska's got that now. It, yes, that, that's that been <laughs> high level you know. in the state for, for a while, but you never keep anybody here. So nope. you got nope. to fix all of that. So football, and it's been pretty fascinating to see two different parts uh, of the Nebraska football recruiting machine do their work. Matt Rule, the last couple of days, uh, touring the 500-mile radius, the rest of his staff down in Chandler, Arizona. We spent a lot of time on Dylan Riola and the prospect and, and excitement for Nebraska legitimately in the Riola sweepstakes, not only because of Uncle Dottie, but just because of what Matt Rule's vision is, his ability to connect and the priority that he's made, not only Riola, but the rest of the state. Uh, Social media has been great this week, detailing that uh, Coach Foley and his his, his, uh, van down by the river have visited 100 high schools 
in the yeah. state of Nebraska already. It's one thing to say, hey, we want to keep everybody here. We want Nebraska to be all in together. But they've put their words into action uh, this this whole recruiting cycle. Uh, and, and you get the, the state as one big community. Uh, man, it makes people feel good, but it really – gets the fan base, the the local kids, and, of course, the high school coaches excited when they're included. They feel part of the solution here to get Nebraska football back up and running. And uh, it, it's it's been really awesome to see. You have a lot of excitement, a lot of juice going on, and just just brilliant by, by Nebraska to continue to prioritize Riola, but also prioritize uh, big and small high school coaches across the state. Yeah, and it's it's a good thing too because it I think I think Matt Rule's style of recruiting it, it's fairly similar to what TO used to like to do too. Mills where and, you, and Dan Young too, yeah. Where, where you really prioritize athleticism, like explosive athletic traits of some sort. Elijah, I think you were talking about this um last last weekend where it's just like you know, somebody that's got 40 plus inch hops really gets on their radar. Somebody who runs 10, five or below really gets on the radar. Somebody that's six, seven. And like, I don't know, is super twitchy and quick gets a, if you have some sort of superior athletic gift, whether or not you are, you have all the numbers in football, whether or not you're in a thousand yard receiver or if I, they kind of don't worry about that. They're looking for, it's kind of athletic freaks and to that that's an underrated thing about what to and company did they absolutely did compete for and get highly recruited guys like the peter brothers like frazier like you know uh amon like crouch they, they definitely got those guys that were super highly recruited it's not like they shied away from that but they also brought in dudes and this wasn't to's years but they brought in, you know, think about like Matt O'Hanlon. Think about like Scott Shanley. Think about guys that, and this kind of gets back to touring the state, right? Going to all 100 high schools. Like, where are some of those guys at? You know, Shanley was playing, you know, eight-man football. Shanley played for Bellevue East and only started for a year or so. But those dudes were uber athletic. And they ended up being guys, right? <laughs> they ended up being people you could really count on. Think about the Makovicas, right? Those guys were weight room animals um incredible strength and so they got brought in um think about like a terry Keneally. like you know he wasn't uh he wasn't a super highly recruited guy but his frame his frame was yeah you can you can get this dude up to 290 and he'll still be able to move so well, that's the benefit of that's the benefit of touring all these high schools even if they don't have necessarily some sort of bona fide camp circuit superstar if they got some dudes out there that like maybe runs a 10 8 maybe has 40 inch hops maybe has a frame that could carry 260 and run a 4 6 <laughs> right like that I, to me that's what they're looking for as they head out across the state well and in its mentality they're looking yeah. for as well on top of the athleticism you mentioned hyannis and terry keneally uh you saw uh, rip before rip Right. You go get a, a rancher from western Nebraska, give him a mouthpiece and tell him to go murder people on the offensive line. And yeah. it works out well. And that kind of permeates a position group. Um, <laughs> Matthew Braz says Keneally out there raising bulls. <laughs> but no, it, it's a mentality. And, and to your point about the, the, the athleticism and, and finding guys that are twitchy and fast and have track speed. Think about the, the competition mindset you have to have when you're out there running the race trying to win right get get across that finish line or you're a wrestler or listen you, you you're a dual sport standout but man you really like football so no i mean nebraska's done a really solid job of profiling they've got a niche where it's going to be fast but it's also going to be tough and cranek uh, elijah and i have exhausted the dylan riola the last 24 hours. I want to get your take and reaction. If you were to kind of gauge it here, is it, is it just good feels right now that Nebraska's getting publicity off of the investment 
uh, and connection, or do you feel pretty good that Nebraska is actually a consideration? I mean, based on what dad has said and the connection, I absolutely believe Nebraska is a consideration and great story by Brady Altman's too. I want you to read with hailvarsity.com just where Nebraska is in that, that four team race right now for a commitment. Yeah. It, look, I, Nebraska's in as good a position as they could be. I, I don't know. I, it, it's tough to know anymore. Put, put it this way. If he doesn't make it, if, if he doesn't commit to Nebraska right away, it's still not over. Thank you. Right. You know, and, and even if he commits to Georgia and goes to Georgia, it's still not over. That that's the thing with with the transfer portal era now, where it, it's it's just not over. Clearly, Matt Rule and company have made an impression on Dylan Rayola and Dominic. Importantly, right? They've made a real impression on them. But if you're sitting there, you're you're the number one quarterback recruit in the entire country, and you're looking at your kind of couple options right now. Look, jury's still out to a degree with Nebraska. You know, people wise, they're legit. You know, support wise, they're legit. You know, their plan is is solid. You just don't there's know no how it's going to happen. Yeah, yeah. There's there's no results yet. You know, your offensive line kind of still what it is what it is. Of course, you have an uncle. You have you have your uncle there just being like, "Hey, Donovan, you're going to get these dudes right, right? You're not going to let your nephew get killed, are you?" Like, <laughs> you know. So there's that extra motivation, I guess. But look, even if he goes to Georgia. They're going to have other five stars on campus. He could easily finish second or third on the depth chart and be like, "I'm out." Hey, Matt, you still got a spot for me, right? And then cool. transfer over. So, so even if he doesn't commit, I wouldn't lose sleep over. It. I think in the past you lose sleep over things like that, but anymore you don't. You you don't worry about. It. And also, let's let's remember, Nebraska hires Matt Rule. What was that? November 29th was that when it became official, and then two weeks later, Dylan Ryle decommits. From Ohio State, so you talk about like the the, the interest with Rule and with Nebraska, it's got to be real. And I know Ohio State started recruiting another quarterback during that time as well, and it sounds like that left Ryle unhappy. But you also got to think from Ohio State's point of view, whenever they see, oh, Matt Rule's getting hired at Nebraska, I don't know how safe we feel about a guy like Dylan Ryle anymore. We know how much Dylan and his family covet Nebraska, and now they're bringing in a new coach, and we know how hard Matt Rule recruits. Let's go talk to another quarterback just to be safe, and then. Ryla D commits. You, you look at that, and there's there's something there. And yeah. I'm not no recruiting insider, but if you look at it from the inside, you got to think, or from the outside, I should say, you got to think Nebraska's in the driver's seat here, just with with reading tea leaves and with social media posts and with how much the Ryla family, as I said, covets the University of Nebraska. You got to think Nebraska's in the driver's seat. Well, think about what a game changer and quarterback could be and would be. Nebraska's. Missed on some of those over the past years. One of those being Joe Burrow. Mm. Joe Burrow back in the AFC title game. Another chance at a Super Bowl. Former Nebraska quarterback Zach Taylor uh, spearheading bar tours to uh, celebrate and deliver game balls. Our conversation with uh, a proud papa of Joe Burrow, Jimmy Burrow, the head of the uh, AFC title game tomorrow. That's the Rewind. It's next. Hail Varsity continues. Weekend edition presented by Currency. Now back with Hail Varsity Radio with Chris Schmidt and Mark Cranach. Back into it at Tower 2, it's Hail Varsity Radio. We're presented by Currency and but eyes on Cincinnati and Kansas City Round 2 AFC title game. We welcome in longtime coach, uh, former Husker, and uh, a lot of great years uh, with uh, Ohio and, of course, North Dakota State, uh, Jimmy Burrow with us. Coach, thanks for the time. How are we doing? We're doing good. Looking forward to the weekend. I bet you are. And uh, before we jumped on air, weather's been on. A lot of the country's mind. Everybody got to Buffalo uh, okay from the borough crew, it sounds like. <laughs> yeah, we had them coming in from, from a lot of different places. Uh, Nebraska was a big concern, but since you didn't get the big snowstorm there, people were, uh, family was able to, to get, they were able to get out of there and get to Buffalo. And, and uh, we had some, some weather issues there, uh, but not not for, for us watching the game, but but a certain people out of Cincinnati still couldn't get there. We'd have had more fans, but they had some weather issues here. But uh, we had our family and friends and fans there for sure. 
Well, what an impressive win by Cincinnati. Coach, uh, what did they get your take here on, on how the season started in Cincinnati? And if you could circle a, a turning point, a tipping point in, in the year that, that, mm-hmm. got, that got Cincy going. First of all, it started the day before camp when Joe had a, an emergency appendectomy. So that, that, that cracked the whole process. He missed about two weeks of camp. Uh, we had the, the, the new offensive line uh, that had been put together in the off season, So there were some, uh, some hurdles we had to overcome early in the season to kind of get that uh, continuity going with, with the offense. And uh, so, uh, you know, that uh, was, was a hard thing to overcome. I, I think just being able to work together those first few games and, and – uh, come back and, and, and win one here and there. Even the first game when it was probably one of Joe's worst games uh, that he's had in the NFL, uh, he threw a touchdown with no time on the clock, and we have to, we were just going to kick an extra point and win the game, and we, we had it blocked. So uh, things just didn't go our way. And, and, uh, but but uh, there was always uh, still confidence and, and, and hope that uh, you know, we, could, we could put it together, and we did. What's your impression as a longtime football coach seeing the team really rally? And I always get a kick out of – covered Zach when he was here at Nebraska, but I get a kick out of Zach going to the different uh, night spots delivering game balls. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's been fun. Uh, Zach does a great job uh, uh, on and off the field, and uh, so we, we appreciate what he does. Uh, I, Robin and I were able to do that uh, – they asked us if we wanted to present a game ball here in town last week in Athens. So it was the first game ball presented outside of Cincinnati. So that was a lot of, a lot of fun. Uh, but, you know, those guys were prepared last week. I mean, the defense is, is really playing great. The offensive line uh, was unbelievable. We were able to run the ball. And uh, that gave Joe and, and his uh, receivers in the passing game a lot of opportunities to, to not just have to throw – uh, you know, every down. So it was a great team win. Jimmy Burrow with us here on Hale Varsity Radio, AFC title game. Joe Burrow, of course, uh, leading Cincinnati uh, back down to Arrowhead. Let me ask you, Coach, wh- where did you go in Athens? Where did you bring the game ball to? Uh, Courtside. It's a local uh, uh, pizza place and, and uh, a hangout. Uh, that, that's the kind of the main uh, – Little drag there uh, uh, uptown. Uh, we so we had a good mix of of older people, and then that's one of the hot spots, night spots on a Thursday night. So we kind of ha- had the the old group in there, and then here come the students were were coming in for their Thursday night uh, get-togethers, and so it was uh, just a packed house. And we had a, they had done a nice video uh, in conjunction with the uh, with the Bengals, and and we had a game ball and and presented it to to Athens. We certainly appreciate all the support that the people in this area uh, have always uh, given to Joe and and our family, and so it was good to to get that game ball to to the courtside there in town. Now, is is Joe going to get a chance to go sign that game ball and go go see everyone? Well, what kind of event is it like in uh, in Athens whenever Joe comes back hometown? Well, you know, he comes back. He usually just kind of, stays off of court street which is a good thing but uh <laughs> we, we might get him to sign sign that ball uh, uh one of these days I'm, I'm sure he did he did a little video in the locker room which i can't believe uh the Bengals must have asked him right after that win because that's that's uh, I, I i probably would never ask him to do something like that and right after the game but he did a short video thanking athens and presenting them the game ball and uh once again everybody thought it was a was a, a really a, a cool thing to do, and we had a lot of fun. Speaking of the uh, the post game locker room, do you have a a victory cigar picked out for Sunday afternoon? Are you just gonna let let that one go until uh, until the game finishes? Yeah, that's kind of uh, uh, after the game. We we have a, a location where uh, Jamar's dad, Jimmy Chase, and I uh, uh, lit one up last year in in the in the parking lot after the game. So we we know where that place is, and and uh, Jimmy. Uh, smoke cigars way more than me so he'll 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 have me one ready to go <laughs> jimmy burrow is with us hail varsity radio coach you mentioned uh, a lot about cincinnati's you know game plan and, and their balance and being a defensive coach 
put your 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 DC hat on and the in your estimation here what what are the problems Cincinnati poses not just maybe for Kansas City but just for teams around the league uh, Zach seems to have and coach Callahan man th- their offense is so balanced and it seems like t- take one thing away they could be able to beat you with yeah. something else but really, it all starts with the running game, I, I think. If we can run the ball like we did last week, I mean, it just creates all kind of issues for, for a defense. Uh, if we can't run the ball, then we, we, we pretty much throw a lot, throw almost every down, and we can still move the ball that way too, but the running game opens everything up. And then you get to uh, four great receivers, the tight end, Hayden Hurst, and T. Higgins and, and Tyler Boyd and Jamar Chase, are, you know, uh, I, I think they're the, the three best in, in the as, as a unit uh, in, in the league. Uh, Joe can <clears throat> can beat you throwing the ball. He can scramble and and uh, throw off off platform uh, uh, when he does that. So just creates a lot of issues. And then uh, uh, Joe Mixon uh, is is a beast uh, uh, back there at. at uh, the running back position, and and uh, so it presents a lot of problems. Uh, you know, Joe, people try to blitz, and and we we get the ball out hot to, to the receivers and let them run with it. If they if they they drop people back, you know, Joe's really good at finding holes in the zone, and the receivers are all really smart. That's kind of goes unnoticed, and people don't give them as much credit for that. They say they're great athletes, which they are, but they're really smart. They understand coverages. They understand concepts in the passing game, and you put all that together, and you got a, a real explosive uh, uh, offense. And then Zach and and uh, Coach Callahan put a great plan together every week. From an accuracy standpoint, I mean Joe's really special. Is that something he's always had, or is that something you see yeah. him continuing to work on and perfect? No, that's kind of always been his calling card. Uh, you know. Early in in his career, when when as he's developing physically, uh, his arm certainly what is wasn't what it is today. So, I think he understood back then that accuracy uh, was something that that he had to have. And and then uh, as he developed uh, that, and and he became uh, stronger, uh, and, and his arm became stronger, and he his whole body became physically stronger than. Uh, he still was able to maintain that accuracy, and he, he continues to do that. And, and the, the one uh, good thing that, that you see out there, too, is when he scrambles, you know, that's hard to maintain that accuracy, but he seems to be able to to, uh, to be a very accurate passer, again, on his scrambles also. So, once again, it just makes it hard for a defense to defend. Yeah, no matter what happens, he always looks like he's got a level head, whether he's scrambling, whether it's third and eight, third and one. It doesn't matter. He always has a level head. And now you look at this game on Sunday, go into a formidable home field advantage in Arrowhead. But we had Bengals corner Mike Hilton on the sideline on uh, Sunday. It's a great video released by NFL Films uh, saying at the end of the game, we'll see you in Burrowhead, referring to Arrowhead <laughs> Stadium because uh, Joe Burrow still undefeated at Arrowhead. What's your take on that, Joe, going in, in battling not only the Chiefs but also the Chiefs home field advantage? Yeah. You know, the, the crowd doesn't really seem to – to affect uh, Joe and our guys, uh, it, it can't. I mean, Arrowhead is unbelievably loud. Uh, Buffalo Stadium the other day uh, was unbelievably loud, and and Joe started the game off nine for nine and uh, two touchdowns. So, uh, uh, you know, he always says that that his confidence and and his ability and our team's ability or his team's ability to is to be in those situations is is. Uh, uh, you know, shows up because they're prepared. Zach does a great job preparing the, uh, the players individually, and, and Joe is a quarterback, and, and then the team. And he says, if you if you know what you're looking for on game day, and and you, you know what what's supposed to to transpire in, in your game plan and, and in your plays, then you can you can look calm and and confident, and and still understand if things aren't going good that. Your coaches and uh, are going to make adjustments and make changes, and you're still going to to be able to come back. I think he also understands leadership and and uh, what that means as a quarterback. And you you can't you can't lose your cool out there. You can't show uh, a, a, fr- whether it's frustration or or, or too much joy and, and celebration. Uh, 
so that's I think where he gets his uh, his demeanor and how he's he's able to react and and act out there on the football field. Coach Jimmy Burrow with us here. A couple more minutes at Tail Varsity Radio. Joe and Cincinnati off to Arrowhead for the AFC title game and another trip to the Super Bowl, perhaps. Uh, Coach, have you been uh, part of the advisory committee with the uh, the sunglasses con- collection? <laughs> no, people that know me from back in Nebraska or wherever I've been know that any fashion statement that Joe has definitely doesn't uh, – doesn't come from from me, but he he likes to uh, he, he likes to look good and and show confidence uh, uh, when they're traveling and, and game day. My my wife and Joe's mom, Robin, was a fashion merchandising major at the, uh, uh, once she left uh, Cook, Nebraska, to go to go to college, and now she's a principal. But earlier earlier she was involved in things like that, so maybe that that's where he gets it. But uh, he doesn't ask me for for the, uh, what, what he should wear on game day, because some of those things I would probably uh, veto. <laughs> got to have one of these games. He's just got to raid your closet, and we'll see what the outfit looks like. <laughs> oh, yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm still a, a sweatshirt and blue jeans guy. And, and really, Joe, for the most part, is, is like that, too. If you saw him you know, around, around the house, or I'm sure the, uh, the locker room and those type of things, it's, it's pretty casual. But... Uh, uh, over the years, he's he's developed his own sense of of, of what he likes to wear, and and uh, and uh, he he's not he's not uh, afraid to kind of go out there with some of those outfits. Coach, I uh, wanted to get your thoughts uh, if you've had any crossover or connection at all with Matt Rule in the coaching circles, or just a reaction to his uh, his time now in Lincoln as a Nebraska uh, now in the Rule era. I don't know, Matt. Uh, you know, I, I as, as everybody, when I, I knew he was going to be the coach at Nebraska, started reading more more things about him and, and his his uh, resume and what he did at at, uh, uh, at in college. You know, is 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 outstanding and and there's a proven track record there. So uh, you just hope that you know he embraces the the Nebraska tradition and and. Uh, uh, understands it, which I'm sure Trev uh, think you know thinks he does, and and so uh, uh, that all points to to hopefully Nebraska getting back to the, the way it once was uh, uh, once upon a time. So we're we're still Nebraska fans, and uh, I, I hope I hope that they can uh, get it going there. Had a chance not long ago during uh, some of the bowl games, chance to be on Coach Walden's radio show and keeping contact with Jim Walden and I know you coached with him and, and played for him but I, I found out you, you were his neighbor growing up how was coach <laughs> Walden as a neighbor did you have to cut his yard or I mean tell me about no, that experience I, uh we moved next door to him in the fifth grade uh I actually uh, uh became his starting corner as a 10th grader and then then he went to Nebraska you know that's that's a whole story in itself that's how I ended up at Nebraska. I was just on his uh, show. Uh, uh, I think a couple of Saturdays ago, uh, Joe, because I was there with him at, at at Iowa State, and eventually became the head coach at Ames. That's where Joe was born, and so my whole family history is is traced back to to Coach Walden at some point, whether it was next door, <laughs> like going to Nebraska, hiring me at Washington State. Uh, Asking me to go with him to to Iowa State, so uh, he's an important part in 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 the, for, for me not only uh, growing up but just my whole history uh, of uh, of football and being a coach and even uh, uh, Jamie and Dan that ended up playing in Nebraska they they grew up in in Ames Iowa and played for for uh, the, the Little Cyclones because um, that's all because of Coach Wald and he's an unbelievable person and and. Uh, uh, he's done so much for me uh, in my lifetime that, that I'm always uh, indebted to him for, for a lot of the things that I've done in football, for sure. Coach Jimmy Burrow with us, Joe and the Bengals in Kansas City. Coach, enjoy your trip to KC. We'll be rooting for you. Thanks for giving <laughs> us a few minutes today. All right. Thank you. Go Bengals. Go Huskers. The Hale Varsity Radio Saturday Morning Show. Strap yourselves in. Here are your hosts. 
Chris Schmidt. Y'all don't even know he was a virgin until he's 28, and now, roll tide. And Mark Cranach. Time has come for someone to put his foot down. And that foot is me. Back with you, it's Hour 2, Weekend Edition at Tail Varsity Radio, presented by Currency for all your equipment financing needs. Go Currency. Chris Schmidt, Mark Cranach, Elijah Herbal, Brandon Vogel is hanging out uh, as we get going in this second hour and can send emails, chris at hailvarsity.com, reminding you to get that subscription now to Hail Varsity Magazine and dot com, hailvarsity.com backslash offer is uh, how you do that. Uh, I got both pups roaming around. Uh, I think the Labradoodles had seven gallons of water. I don't know if there's more uh, or less uh, Husker hype, if we're going to put it into gallon measurements uh, with the Dylan Riola setup. But, uh, man, it's been an interesting 24 hours. We bring in Brandon Vogel. Vogues, how we doing? Good to see you this Saturday morning. I'm doing well. How are you guys? We're good, man. Uh, good and uh, excited for a weekend of NFL action and also uh, how things uh, continue to shake out here right before signing day, the final signing day for next week. And wanted to start off with Dylan Riola in Nebraska uh, sending nine of the ten down to sunny, warm or warmer Arizona. Uh, your thought on, on the, the, the continual impression Nebraska's making. Yeah, you can't you can't say they're not putting in the work. Um, they, they definitely have displayed <clears throat> the importance to to Dylan uh, in in their mind and this latest kind of uh, onslaught, I guess, for lack of a better term, only only backed that up. And you, you know, you look at this. I, I look at this. Nebraska's got to be in a in a pretty good spot. Who knows who the actual leader is? But you kind of got. He's been to Nebraska multiple times. You've obviously got the uh, deep and intense family connection to the university. And, you know, at the the start of a new coaching regime, landing the number one quarterback in the country uh, would certainly be you'd get a lot of you give it you get a lot of positive buzz just based on that. Um, You know, players still got to come in and produce. But if Nebraska were able to land him. Boy, would that be kind of a, a real shot in the arm, I think, for just Nebraska football the brand. Let's let's compare it historically to Brandon, where in the past, now Tommy Frazier wasn't necessarily the number one quarterback in the country before the option he was. There's no question about that. You fast forward five or so years, same with Crouch, right? Like maybe not the best quarterback in the country, but the best option quarterback. Since then, would you say Nebraska I, – I don't think Nebraska has landed some sort of like consensus, surefire, incredibly talented quarterback that everybody was after. I think Nebraska's just kind of gotten some dudes. Few of them have panned out in different ways. Right. Or, or am I missing somebody? I'm just trying to think back. Last 20 some years has Nebraska been in the sweepstakes for basically a can't miss guy like that. No, not not at that level of quarterback that I can recall. I mean, honestly, in terms of kind of buzz, <laughs> is Tanner Lee as close as you get? I was um, going to say. I mean, serious. How about a guy that never ended up on campus in Bubba Starling? Bubba Starling. I mean, maybe. I think I think the real answer of, of somebody who was very very close to Nebraska is is Lamar Jackson. And mm. you know, if you talk to Tim Beck. You know, he'll he'll still say they were they thought they had him, um, and it, it kind of fell apart there at, at the at the last second. And goes to Louisville has a great career there, of course. That's probably as close as they come. But I'd have to go back and look at what Lamar Jackson was as a as a high school prospect. He was obviously highly rated, but was he you know Riola Manning level, um, which we've seen in these past two classes? Probably not. That, Matthew on the stream. Thank you, Matthew. Harrison yeah, Beck. Harrison Beck. That's, that's pretty yeah. good. That's pretty good. And he and he was up there. I don't think he was a five star guy though, right? I don't think he was like. I, we have to go back and look at it. He he was right there. They they took him. He was over highly Mark, touted. They took him over Mark Sanchez. That's the he, uh, he, he was highly <laughs> touted. Urban, urban rumor. He was, but I, I guess my point in in bringing that up is like, 
is that really what's been missing, right? Like, do, do you need to land that dude at quarterback, which then will attract the off, the, the incredible offensive linemen, the incredible running backs, the incredible, it's that halo effect that you get from landing that dude. It, it could be. I, I have a hard time saying it's missing because it's been missing. Um, I've been somebody through our duo Martinez eras, and we were all well aware of kind of the limitations and the mistakes that, that came with Taylor and, and Adrian at times. But when I look at those, I, those quarterbacks were, were obviously talented. Um, and I thought they played at a level probably higher than Nebraska achieved as a team. So when I look at that, you know, it's kind of like, oh, well, where's the breakdown? Like, yeah, you, you don't want to fumble that much. And, and the turnovers hurt, but uh, those things are, are kind of tough. So, you know, somebody like Ryola, just with his kind of standing in this, this 2024 class and his prestige and his links to Nebraska, I do think you get an effect in Nebraska recruiting overall that kind of says, okay, something's going on here. That's, that's different than where Nebraska has been because we're going to look at this 2023 class. They're going to end up right where Nebraska has traditionally been in kind of team rankings. And that's, that's an achievement in my mind. Brandon, if, uh, if nine people rolled up to your house trying to sell you on something, your reaction would be what? <laughs> um, <laughs> go away. <laughs> I, 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 I'm uncomfortable when I, when I get the one out of nowhere visitor. You know, the door-to-day door salesman days are, are largely over, but I'd say one, two, three times a year because I'm pretty much home um, all the time. Uh, you get somebody, you hear a doorbell ring at, at noon. It's like, what is this? I uh, wasn't expecting a package, and it's somebody on your front step. So you're like, hey, have you ever thought about uh, gutter guards? You'd be like, yeah, I thought about it a lot. I uh, haven't made the purchase yet, so have a nice day. See, that, that, doorbell rings, yeah. that doorbell rings, and you hope it's like Girl Scouts with cookies, and then it's always gutter guard people or like some product you don't need, and you go, damn, I wish it was cookies. Every time. You, you hope it's someone selling cookies. I hope it's a nurse from Ferris Bueller's Day Off, but I guess we just think <laughs> but, I'll be uh, right back Googling. Bogues, <laughs> <laughs> you did a great story and feature uh, in the latest Hale Varsity magazine issue. We have it here for folks to see on the stream, get the subscription. But you touch on, on, on Satterfield and – yeah, th- there we go. Thank you. That's the, she looks kind of crazy, man. I don't, I don't know about uh, that. Uh, crazy is okay sometimes. Um, <laughs> I, I, I'm interested in Satterfield and, and his offense. And then, all right, let's apply that here as we continue to talk Dylan, R- Dylan, Dylan Riola. Currently, you have a, a, a room full of quarterbacks here and now. Future is Riola. But let's talk about that application for, for, for the room now and then for, for maybe Riola here with Satterfield. Yeah, kind of looking at that story in the magazine you mentioned at where these both coordinators, offense and defense, have been at, during their previous coordinator stints, compared it a little bit to, to Nebraska. I mean, I think the big thing for me with Satterfield is he came out right out of the gates, first time we got a chance to talk to him, talking about we want to run the football. Um, music to a lot of Nebraska fans ears, but you'll look at his stints uh, at Temple and then at South Carolina. They weren't that run heavy. And I, and I try not to get too caught up in like, oh, they were only like 45% instead of 55. Like everyone's going to kind of fall between those, those ranges for the most part, unless you're a service Academy or Minnesota of late. <laughs> um, so th- it's for me it's more about running the football effectively being able to run it when when you need to and want to um and if you do that well enough well you might end up with more pass attempts you know i saw something i can't remember from where it was from one of the stats people on twitter noted that last year i think south carolina was top 10 in terms of percentage of passes thrown at or behind the line of scrimmage which is interesting when you consider you know spencer rattler has has always had kind of all the arm talent in the world. Um, So that was, you know, a a little bit more something you associate. I associate, I think most people right now associate more with the spread, but you think back to kind of the Callahan years, uh, Marlon Lucky catching 75 balls in a season. Uh, It can be a part of the pro style offense too. Um, Nebraska's in a good spot in that 
you know, Casey Thompson's coming off of surgery, but super experienced quarterback. You also got Jeff Sims in the mix now, who, who's played a ton of football. So I think they're good there. The thing that Nebraska and South Carolina's offense in 2022 shared was they were both kind of explosiveness over efficiency, which, if, you know, you the world is your oyster and you can choose one. I think you choose efficiency. But I think Satterfield, with what North South Carolina did last season, comes to a Nebraska offense that has some of those same capabilities in terms of big plays. Trev Alberts this week on uh, his radio show alluded to it. I didn't I didn't read read into it too much or or, or listen to it myself, but just you know um, haven't seen the quotes. Mentioned the spring game and just saying it's going to be football. Are we to read into that, that it's not going to be modified scoring system, green jerseys all over the place, tagging off on running backs, w- weird punting competitions? And like, is it just going to be a football game with two teams playing, I don't know, football? I, I, I certainly hope so. That was my, my first reaction. And, and even beyond, you know, the, you're not, we're not we're not giving the defense points for stops. Not that those things aren't important, but nobody can keep up with it. You need a you need a a menu of of how this thing is actually scored. I hope it means that you know instead of going through the dance of we don't want to put too much on film in this spring game. It's on the Big Ten Network. You know people are watching. Um, yeah. Let's get rid of the paranoia. Let's just let's just go out there and like use that as an actual practice um, instead of forfeiting one of your 15 spring practices. Um, like use it. I mean, it, I, particularly at the start of a new regime, I think Nebraska could could use that time to to go out and run things. And whether whether we see like a sliver of what Nebraska wants to be in 2023, or we see a bigger slice, like. We're all going to make too much of it and talk about it for the next two months anyway. So go out there and do something that that feels good for the fans, but also helps you accomplish something, I think, from a, from a simple practice perspective. They, they ran outside zone. Frank, get out, get out your notepad. Like, we got Nebraska <laughs> scouted now. Like, come on. Oh, well, they made it four wide receivers. You know, I mean, come on. What are they trying to hide? Yeah. Brandon, while we're talking uh, spring game here, can you give me a, a couple of names you're interested in seeing in that game? And I know it's, it's way too early here. We haven't even gotten reports out of spring practice of who's looking good and, and who might be getting significant play time. But can you give me a, a name or two that is intriguing to you and you want to see on the on the field for Nebraska this spring? And a prediction yeah. of who wins, red or white. Yes. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, definitely. Um, I, I'm thinking uh, – I mean, I'm, I'm interested to see Jeff Sims. And he's going to be a, a big part, I think, of the discussion around Nebraska football. Um got the chance to watch him a bit at, at Georgia tech and obviously came in as a really highly touted recruit interested there. I'm interested in, in Ben Scott, the the transfer who probably, I mean, at this point we would assume is, is in, in the mix at center or maybe he, he ends up some, someplace else. Um, I'm kind of interested also to see, well, two receivers that were on the team, but not, but now they're back in Garcia, Castaneda and Betts. Um, I think will be interesting too. Like Garcia Castaneda, you maybe expect to to hit the ground running a little bit more, or at least I do. Um, Bets it'll just be like you you are away for the game for for nearly a, a year. Um, let's let's see how that pans out. So a lot of intrigue on offense for me. Um, I'm probably leaving off a couple of defense guys that I'll I'll regret later. But Nebraska, you know, has got a lot of known kind of known quantities on on that side of the ball. Brendan Vogels with us, HailVarsity.com and Magazine Managing Editor, author with John Cook, Dream Like a Champion, at Brandon L. Vogel on Twitter. Vogels, what do you make of what Rule's done the last couple of days, and, and that's pretty heavy in Missouri uh, and also the Kansas City region, and it's not just the 500-mile radius, but these are really, if we're going to look at the stars next to the names, they're four- and five-star guys. I mean, we're talking – top six, top three, top eight at their respective positions on top of a couple of offensive tackles, defensive linemen, wide receivers. And to your knowledge, what did Rule go after? Did he go after stars or fit? And and to me, he he's always prioritized fit, but just because that fit has now four or five stars next to it, he didn't shine away. I mean, he, he may be a little – 
late or later to the party, but he's still showing up with uh, kids in this region. And, and that's kind of music to my ears, Nebraska getting back into Missouri. Yeah, I, I think fit will will kind of forever be where they where they start with things. That said, you know, you come in, you take a new job. All right, we got to figure out quickly, like, who's staying from the, the currently committed 2023 class? Who else do we need to go get? Who can we get in with and, and have a shot at, at signing eventually? You do that. You also got to kind of, like, start looking towards towards 2024. It's a lot all at once. So I think with some of the guys that we've seen offered and where they're from, you know, it's good in my mind because it indicates that Kansas City and St. Louis and really the state of Missouri as a whole, um, it, this staff rule himself, you know, whoever it is, probably a collective effort, it, is aware of the importance of that region. And, you know, you look through Nebraska's history at some of the great players that have come from the state of Missouri. You got to you gotta get in there. And, and Nebraska had some success in Kansas City, you know, fairly recently. It, it struggled to kind of crack St. Louis over the past five, six, seven recruiting cycles, I think. Got to get in there. Um, so overall, when I look at this recruiting plan, you know, Ed Foley is out there. He's been to like 300 some schools in Nebraska, it seems. Uh, Matt Rule has, well, they got to Arizona, uh, has set up his like Texas, Nebraska outpost, which is also super fascinating. And, and now they're getting to kind of the 500 mile radius plus a little bit when you look at Missouri and just some of those more regional recruits. So I think it's been a, a pretty solid approach to knowing what you can get at Nebraska and knowing what you've been able to get in the past. Brandon Vogel with us on Hale Varsity Radio as we talk Nebraska football. Um, and by the way, shout out on the uh, on the uh, tour. They, they made it to Stella's. Shout out Bellevue. Shout out Best Burger in Nebraska. I know that's controversial, mm. but mm. I'm going to go with that. Um, shout out Franco's family. So, what do you make of, and you alluded to it earlier about Xavier Betts, Isaiah, Isaiah Garcia, Castaneda, just the wide receiver room as a whole. I we talked about it last weekend as just being like, I think it skews towards probable given the guys that you have added to Marcus Washington and Elante Brown, who I view as sort of your, your stabilizers. Your, you know what you're going to get with those guys. You could probably get more from both of them. Um, but you're adding five pretty high profile either they've been super productive already or they are like top 100 with malachi coleman xavier betts i think it skews towards probable that you're going to get production out of that room right like i i just can't imagine that the wide receiver room is going to be some sort of i don't know detriment to the team no i don't think it's i don't think i don't view it as a detriment at this point um you know Receiver is one of those positions where you can make an impact early. Um, experience helps. Continuity between your quarterback and your receiving core helps. Nebraska doesn't totally check that box. When I look at that group, I see a lot of potential. I think what you're the, – the question I can't answer right now is kind of like, who's your top fly guy? Who's the guy when it's third and nine and you're like, okay, we just – we're going to try and go there, um, you know, Based on their usage last year, I guess Marcus Washington kind of holds that title until we actually get into practice and yeah. stuff like that and see what what happens in the off season. That's kind of the piece there where I'm like, okay, who, who's going to fill that role? And I think that makes it intriguing for for some of those younger prospects who are coming in. Um, you know, like a Malachi Coleman. You know, that he doesn't have to, I think, be that kind of player, but there's there's potential there. Um, for just that that receiver who you can count on to win one on one more often than not, that's kind of the one missing piece. But I think they've got a lot of options to somebody can develop into that role, and they've got a lot of options to choose from. Brandon, in, in an ideal world, do you think that Matt Rule wants to be starting freshmen on this team next season in order to get them some some experience and you know set up the future? Do you think in an ideal world he wants to let those guys sit and develop and get ready? Because there's two sides to that coin. One is that. Yeah, whenever you put freshmen in, they're going to make freshman mistakes. But on the other hand, getting them some experience is going to help you two, three years down the road. Yeah, I, I don't think he has to do that. Uh, you know, with a, with a coaching change, I think you'll always have, if you're a freshman coming in with a, a new coaching staff, you'll always have a, a couple of, of better percentage points of seeing the field right away. Um, 
just by by nature of coaches look at this and that's a guy I'm going to have for multiple years. You know, Matt Rule on, on the Bustle with the Boys podcast said that's what they chose to do essentially at Temple. Like they they kind of ripped the Band-Aid off, played a ton of freshmen right away, um, went two and ten, I think. Um, and it was rough, but it paid off, paid off down the line. I don't think you have to go that route at, at Nebraska, though I do expect um, – there's a better chance for, for some of those young players, those newcomers, um, even young transfers who are a little bit earlier in their career but to make an impact that maybe is a little bit harder two, three years down the road. Brandon Vogel with us. Vogues, what's uh, on the radar for you and Hale Varsity this weekend? Yeah, uh, I have basketball coverage on on the website, of course, this weekend. We'll see what, what pops up uh, recruiting-wise. There's always seems to be something new going on there. And busy preparing our, our February issue. Um, we'll hit on women's basketball a little bit more there. Got the start of softball and baseball. So so that's been good. Uh, softball team plays pretty, pretty soon, actually. Um, so looking forward to getting those things started. And other t- other long term projects in terms of uh, terms of football and breaking down this this new era as it continues to unfold. And folks, before we get you out of here, I need your uh, your Sunday NFL predictions: Niners, Eagles, Chiefs, Bengals. Who you got going to the Super Bowl? I'll go Chiefs, Niners because I can't. I don't know. Ooh, a rematch! I don't have anything again against the state of Philadelphia, but my, my all, all my in laws are Eagles fans, and so I want them to be sad. Wow. I'm just kidding. <laughs> yeah. Man. I, like he, he wasn't very, I think that's it. He wasn't very call, convincing. A, the, uh, the old Stone Cold classic in the 49ers uniforms. I and mean, Eagles has just never worked for me. Mm, fair enough. I, I don't like Philly fans, except for, for Pastor Scheich, of course. But, I mean, that's my biggest problem is Philly fan, right? I mean – yeah, yeah. I guess we better be careful if we're if we're all anti Eagles. Might anger anger Matt Rule. Well, well and, but, hey, and as a as a uniform guy, what is up with that Eagles green blue? What it's terrible, absolutely it is terrible. Give me give me the black. Give me the black. Yeah. Well, which looks terrible with that dark greenish blue. It's that they have the worst uniforms in the NFL. Yep, more fashion NFL next weekend, yeah. folks. Yeah. Take care, bud. Thanks for the time today. There he is, Brandon Vogel with us on Hale Varsity. Quick timeout. We'll hit the home stretch here, the weekend edition with Hale Varsity presented by Currency. The Iron Horse on the way. Gary Sharp up next. Glad to have you back. Yes, sir. You heard me right. Here are the guys, Schmidt and Cranach. Well, Hector, here's the game plan. We're going to bring us two absolute martinis. You know how I like them, straight up. And then precisely seven and one half minutes after that, you're going to bring us two more. And then... Two more after that every five minutes until one of us passes out. Excellent strategy, sir. Back with you. It's weekend edition. It's Hale Varsity Radio presented by Currency. Chris Schmidt, Mark Crane, Ankle, Elijah Herbal, the Iron Horse. With us, Gary Sharp. Sharpie, I love the stocking hat, man. Has anyone freaked out when you went in to get coffee this morning? Uh, not yet, but it's. Uh, I'm in Tulsa, Oklahoma, and it's like ah. 60 here today. So oh. it does look a little odd. I thought you would comment on my, for the second straight week, the uh, artwork <laughs> in the hotel room that I'm staying in. Well, hmm. you know, I, I'm sorry, but I see, uh, was it Eminem or Gary Sharp, my man, uh, jumping <laughs> on? I love it. It's okay. Yeah, this, is a new, this is a new look. I, I, I'm having a midlife crisis in uh, 2023, so I'm going with this look. Well, I no, love doing 8 Mile. Like, love doing okay. 8 Mile. Yeah, yeah, you were good. What's the, art, <laughs> what's the artwork behind you? Is it some guy in a boat staring off? Uh, into the, uh, no, I beyond? believe it is somebody wandering through a forest. Mm. Yeah, which huh. hangs above your bed, which is kind of a little creepy. Yeah, it's not uh, nine folks in, in red zip ups uh, can, on the doorstep. Can can we talk real quick? Uh, hotel artwork and themes. Okay, so yes. <laughs> January of like I don't know twenty oh four or something like that. Go to Williston, North Dakota. It was for a JUCO hoops. <laughs> you know, it's life when you're trying to come up, right? Um, and it's it's negative twenty, right? And the, the entire hotel is decorated in palm trees and pineapples. And it just pissed me off. You know, you're just like, stop it, you lying jerks. Like, you look outside, and 
you know, people are, oh my God, Who, who's got the worst artwork? Because Gary, you've you've had to go to some far flung uh, places as as UNO has tried to has, has tried different conferences and different sports, and so you've been to some spots that people haven't been to. Where's the worst hotel scene and theme that you've had to endure? Uh, clearly, Macomb, Illinois, where Western Illinois is, because yeah. when you go into the bathroom and right above the uh, toilet is like this picture that's supposed to look like Macomb, but I'm pretty sure that Macomb does not have that many streetlights. Mm. <laughs> so false advertising. And it's a little bit intimidating. Yeah, I, I, I would say so. <laughs> yes. Uh, yeah. yeah. This is Macomb, Illinois, is the, the ranker right now for Sharpie. Gary, uh, let's gauge your, your take here on, on Nebraska and the Riola race. Uh, well, it's, it's clearly a priority when you send nine coaches there, uh, you know, and, and then it's kind of interesting. He's in a good spot. Uh, Dylan is because everybody wants him and he's going to be at USC this weekend, but it's clear that Nebraska is back into the game and they've made him a priority. And I think they're handling it the right way. And, you know, it's, it's, you have to present something to him that just doesn't have to do with his uncle or his dad, that there is something there that if he comes here, he's going to get to where he wants to go, and that is the NFL, but ultimately win on the football field. So it's kind of like the staff is starting from behind, but, boy, it's, it feels like they've made up a lot of ground in a short amount of time just by being adults, you know, handling the situation. Hey, we realize your importance to Nebraska. We, we want you to be here, and this is what we're going to show you, and we're going to lay out the plan. And I, I can't imagine none of us have ever been recruited like that except for Elijah where you have that much of attention on you and you don't know how to handle it. Cause I mean, everybody is saying, you know, the same things. We want you, we want you, we want you, but I'll give credit to Nebraska and Matt rule. They got back into the game and they're in the game. I, I don't know if they're a front runner, but I'll tell you what, they're going to make it hard for him to say no, which is ultimately what you want. If he's not going to pick a school just based on winning and losing. Gary, Gary I, Sharp is with us. I, I do oh, appreciate the Gary, uh, the, the compliment Gary on that one. But I'll tell you what, Midland never sent nine assistant coaches to come visit Elijah Herbal. So, <laughs> I mean, well, their lot. About, guys, do you think that's overwhelming? I mean, we look at it from the outside and go, "Wow, nine coaches, that's cool." But do you think that's a little overwhelming? I mean, a little. Depends. Depends. Like, I'd imagine it's the, a statement the, to the other. It's the statement to the other schools that are recruiting him for sure. Now, it's overwhelming yeah. if you live in a two-bedroom apartment. <laughs> but I'd imagine the Rayola's got some, got some square footage. And so it's just kind of fine. You just kind of, like, hey, go hang out by the pool. Go hang out by the jacuzzi. <laughs> go play on our full-court basketball that we got in the back. You know, go play some pickleball. I think they have, like, probably an athletic complex on that, uh, on that property. Oh, probably. You know, it's, it, and Gary Sharp is with us. He's going to record a House of Pain video. Uh, a little bit later on, <laughs> Gary. Speaking of speaking of recruiting, uh, the Omaha area and, and really Nebraska as a whole now, how much has the game changed in the last decade in terms of competition? They used to be kind of just Nebraska's. You know, you would occasionally get somebody leak out to Notre Dame or something like that. But how how fierce is the competition? How much of a stop is the Omaha and Nebraska area for? for coaches well outside of Nebraska. Well, you know what? And, and Mark and, and, and Schmidt and Elijah, you guys are all familiar with the high school football in this area. And it has gotten ex- – it, it has taken to a whole other level. The coaching is better. The depth across the entire metro area is better. And it's turned into a year-round sport in Omaha with everything you can do outside of your high school season. And there are some extremely talented players. And the exposure, and I don't think it's just Omaha. I think it's the entire state. When you're in a state like Nebraska, which is landlocked and only 1.9 million people, and people look over it as a flyover state. Now, there's some great football talent, whether it be in Ainsworth or in Omaha, but there's so many different avenues out there to get your film out that people become very aware quickly of what we have in Nebraska. And you look at the schools that have rolled through Nebraska or rolled through Omaha, well, and Nebraska. I mean, it's impressive. It's very impressive, and I think it makes Nebraska it, – it, it's, a, it's a pro and a con for Nebraska. It's a pro because the talent is on the Big Ten level right now of a good handful of players every year in the state of Nebraska. So 
Nebraska doesn't have to go far to get guys that could come in and they can play at your conference level. The con is there are so many different options and Nebraska hasn't given you a reason to say yes yet. They haven't done something on the field. They can build up all kinds of relationships. But if somebody comes in and they say, hey, you know, we were in the playoff last year. Look at what we have. I mean, that's a little bit tough. And in Omaha, there's so many different options where Nebraska isn't front and center like other places in the state. But I think it's great moving forward. I I think if Matt Rule plays his cards correctly, and we've seen that, I mean, where in the world is Ed Foley this morning? And and where is his cholesterol level after all the places that he's eaten? I mean, Nebraska is doing it the right way. They just need that one or two guys in the 24-25 class to say yes. And then I think you'll start to see a stream of players that will follow because those are some of the headliners in this town. Gary, tell me a little bit about Christian Jones from up at Westside. He got a, an offer from USC yesterday, and I just want to get your take on him. You've seen him a, a little bit more than we have down here in Lincoln. And, and is he the next can't-miss in-state prospect from the inside the state borders of, of Nebraska? I would say, how about that? How A, a kid at Omaha Westside gets an offer from USC. Guys, USC has come into Omaha. I mean, we when Avante Dickerson got the offer from Oregon, we were like, whoa. Now he now USC is in in Omaha. And why not? Because they're going to join the conference next year. He is a he is a really has taken a huge jump. First of all, you saw him like an eighth grade and you knew he was going to be good. Then he went to Omaha Burke and he was on the field as a freshman at Omaha Burke. And he just had that knack. He had that instinct playing outside and playing in space. And as you saw this past year at Westside is him playing in space. He's got great closing speed. Um, I kind of also like him on the offense side of the ball, but his future is playing linebacker I just think he's a smart kid he's his body is something that is going to get bigger but his speed and his closing speed but his ability to cover tight ends and running backs out of the backfield in space I think is one of his best attributes he's just a really really good player that the more the season went on for Westside and there were a lot of players to recognize you would go and watch Westside play and you would recognize Christian Jones. It wasn't at the beginning of the year, but towards the tail end, he really made an impact. And I'll tell you what, that is, you know, Nebraska and the previous staff, they were on him early. That's a really smart offer by USC and other schools that have come in to offer Christian Jones because he's going to be the next great linebacker to come out of Omaha. Gary Sharp with us here on Hale Varsity Weekend. Sharp, you want to go to basketball here for a minute and – it just keeps getting you know, steeper for Fred and, and Nebraska. You've worked a lot in your career with Trev Alberts. And uh, without asking you to, to read his mind, um, how do you think he's evaluating uh, Fred? I think he's got a tough – Schmidt, Elijah, and Mark, I think he's got a tough job. Because it's clear that this year's Nebraska basketball team is different. It almost feels like year one. The cohesiveness is better. They, he went out and hired a defensive coach, and we've seen that's been a little bit different. Now, the con is Fred is an offensive guy, and this is a very poor shooting basketball team. The roster construction this year, you know, they got a bunch of guys that are three, four, five options on a Big Ten starting five, but they play hard. Um, and they've been able to pull the parking brake when they've gotten into these ruts where, you know, a five game losing streak doesn't lead to a six or a seven and an eight or a nine like we've seen in the past. But now he's in kind of dire straits because they don't have enough bodies. I don't know. I, I I think Fred will be back, but boy, it's tough to say that guys on January 28th with a decimated roster and still a month and about three weeks to go to see where this is going. Um, But it's almost like, man, you're Nebraska basketball. Yes, exactly. If you're Nebraska basketball, it is one of those things where, man, what what did we do to to anger anybody? What did Danny knew Danny need do when he left the left the building? Um, because Nebraska basketball just can't get any momentum. You could say they're cursed, whatever. It's just one thing after another. When this season, I mean, people are going to forget that they beat Creighton, they beat Iowa, they took Purdue to overtime. Um, so I think it's important for Fred to keep guys' heads above water. It's going to be tough to find some victories along this stretch. Um, but I, I, I think Trev in a, in a tough spot, I think Trev will make the decision that, you know what, Fred, I'm going to, I'm going to trust Fred that he can go find the next Greasel and Walker. A thing that would help Fred that he can't do anything about right now is he doesn't have a McGowan's on the hook. We don't know about Ramel Lloyd. We don't know about Eli Rice who's coming in next year. 
none of those guys you go, man, they're a they're a game changer, like a McGowan's would be, where if you were fighting for your job, you'd say, hey, you know Trev, Vandermill Gary is out. You know what kind of what that does to our roster, but hey, look at what I have coming. Fred doesn't have that right now, so you have to put faith in if you're bringing him back to say, hey, he's going to go find in the portal guys that can make a difference and guys that can go get you buckets. Gary Sharp is with us on Hale Varsity Radio. We'll be listening to Ice Cube's death certificate after we get off of this uh, radio You're show. You're just nailing all of the uh, the great albums, and, and you just hit one right there. I, you went House of Pain. Now it's now it's death certificate. We've had an Eminem shout out. I mean, we're, we're yeah. right there. We're right there. He's got a great he's got a great beanie on for people that are not watching and only listening. Um, yeah. Now with hoops, is Fred a, is Fred a grinder? Does 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 what Trev wanted in a football coach apply to all coaches? Does Fred fit that mold that that Trev wants? Um, I th- I don't know when I th- when I think Fred, I don't immediately say grinder, but don't confuse his personality for a guy that is on easy street. And there goes Gary. <sighs> yeah. He was mm. he's saying easy street. Uh, that was going to be oh oh there he is. Okay, there he is. Back. Yeah. We got you back. Oh, okay. Reese, Gary, Reese, Reese Gary we lost we, we 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 lost you at easy street. Um, you can you can go ahead with Electric which, Avenue, whichever. Which I I was going down that path to use you know Fred Hoiberg as a grinder, comparing him to some of the greatest rappers. Um, mm. He easy he, don't easy. don't confuse his personality, you know, which is kind of laid back, more of a pro personality for a guy that doesn't grind. I think I think he gets after it, but he gets after it in a different way. You know, it, it may come down, guys, also to the personality. You know, Trev and Fred's relationship. Um, but I, I, you know, it's it's one of those things where I think Fred this year, and th- this is a bonus for Fred. We all know what it was like coming into this year, and Fred Fred adjusted. Fred changed this year in the way he approached, and I think that's a that's a sign for an older coach that's been around the block at a bunch of different places to be able to change on the fly. I don't know. That's why this whole conversation, and remember, it's January 28th. They play Maryland today. That's not going to be easy, is <clears throat> E. <laughs> it's, it's a tough discussion. It's a tough, it's a tough decision because there, there's a ledger of, okay, these things look a lot different in year number four, but then there's no guarantee that in year five it's going to pop. And if you're watching the game on Wednesday night, did you, did you three guys go, man, how come Nebraska can't be Northwestern? You know, what is Northwestern doing? And Northwestern lost two key guys that are helping other Power 5 teams, and they're on the cusp of going back to the NCAA tournament after a lengthy disappearance. I found myself going, wow, why why can't Nebraska find a Ty Berry? Why can't they find a Boo Booey? You know, where's that at for Nebraska basketball? Gary Sharp is with us here on a Saturday morning edition of Hale Varsity Radio. And, Gary, from your time around Trev with his time at UNO, what's your 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 take on you know the, the past six months for Trev being a factor in this Fred Hoiberg decision? Is it an exhaustive coaching search for the football team? And do you think that Trev's the type of guy that will might push off a coaching search for basketball for a year just because you know what after the past six months he doesn't want to go into another coaching search? But or, or is he just the grinder type that you know what he's going to do what's best for the university no matter what? And if he thinks it's time for Fred to go, he, he's willing to go you know, start another coaching search despite how crazy the past six months have been? I think he'll look at what's best for the players inside of the program and the program in general. I think Trev has a good feel of the vibe of a program, of what the student athletes are doing, how they carry themselves, um, you know, discussions with coaches and their blueprint and their plan. And I think he has a good read on, do you have momentum going forward? Do you have a plan um, that can lead to success? And, you know, it's kind of it's kind of a mystery because we're so focused on the football search and what Matt Rule's done in a short amount of time. Now things start to shift to Fred. And really, I, I think Trev is very appreciative of Fred this year because Fred said at the begin in the middle of the summer, guys, this is going to be a likable team. You're going to like this team. They're going to play hard. Well, I think we all agree that when they've had their core together, we feel that way. Mm-hmm. Um, but now things shift. I, I, I think there was a quote the other day. And, and, and again, I, I think Trev has a good beat on the pulse of a program. And he listens to a lot of different people. I, you know, we're all saying, oh, man, I guess the evaluation of Fred is closed now that he loses two key guys. Trev the other night said, 
you know what? Everybody has injuries. Let's see how you deal with them. And I thought, whoa, okay, this evaluation process is still going on. Um, I, I, I go back and forth, guys, on what's going to happen. But I, I think unless it's Fred's decision, I, I think Fred will be back for year number five. Um, and it's, you know, are, are you guys in the, in the mode? Because I'm getting this from my friends and my listeners is, yeah, okay, if he comes back, great. If he doesn't come back, great. See what a weird, weird balance that yeah. is. Yeah. It, it is, and and I I lean towards bring him back, and I you know there's been so, some resistance with that because the the record doesn't lie. But to your point, and I think we've seen it, you've seen change. You've seen a change in behavior, a change in it's more blue collar. And we were talking about that earlier this week too. And you know what? Good for him because too many coaches, too many times dig in okay. and and say, you know, this is how it's going to be. I'm right. Just got to trust the process, and it doesn't ever pop. Well, well I, I think the, the the mood around Nebraska is that, you know what, if Fred Hoiberg can't be the guy to, to get it done and get Nebraska their first tournament win, who the hell can? Because, I mean, it's, it's Fred Hoiberg. Well, yeah, and, yeah, and, and you know what, and Elijah, we all said that when he got hired. Oh, wow, this is the guy that's perfect for Nebraska. And, you know, Nebraska basketball has been meandering in the desert for a while, but – my, my counterpoint to that is there's a guy in Manhattan, Kansas, who nobody knew except for inside of the basketball world who Jerome Tang was. He comes in, utilizes the portal, and look at Kansas State is right in the mix in America's toughest conference of winning the Big 12. So there's that part of it. It's just, you know, it, it's, a, it's just a program that hasn't been able to harness any momentum for a long time where you have spurts of you feel good, you like going to the games. It's a likable team, but they just haven't been able to sustain it. And then there's something that happens, either a, a wonky loss or you start to lose guys to injuries. And this year, that's the worst thing that could happen mm. because when they have had their core together, really the core four, they've been a pretty good basketball team. But, man, that game against Creighton, which ironically was on the Sunday that the Chiefs and the Bengals may, met in the regular season – Fast forward to tomorrow when the Chiefs and Bengals meet again and look at the difference of how you feel about Nebraska basketball from the first Sunday in December to the last Sunday in January. Sharp, you let us in. We got about a minute or two here. Your thoughts, Chiefs fan. Uh, are you feeling okay tomorrow or, oh, no, it's Cincinnati? And then let's give me a thought here on Philly and San Fran as well real quick. So it's going to be cold at Burrowhead. Uh, but that's okay. Both teams are outdoor teams. Thank God we didn't have a neutral site game. Uh, remember, everybody talks about the Bengals being 3-0 against Mahomes and the Chiefs, and they are. But those three games have all been deficit of, of three points. And in those games, Kansas City has led. Kansas City has had a lot of self-inflicted uh, mistakes. This is a great Bengals team. I mean, especially with Joe Burrow at quarterback, it changes them. But I wonder if Cincinnati finally, the offensive lineman down, catches up to him. I, not being a homer, I do like the Chiefs at home tomorrow to get revenge from last year. On the other side, man, you're going to get popped. And I think the Niners will hit Jalen Hurts as much as possible. That'll be a tight game. But I believe that Philadelphia will eke it out. And Nick Sirianni will enjoy another national chain of pizza as a celebratory uh, meal. He's gone from uh, Pizza Hut to Little Caesars to what would be the next? Papa John's? Oh, he'll, he'll go Michael Scott and go to Sbarro. <laughs> which would be fantastic they finally have one of those mark they finally have one of those back in omaha i know i saw that it's great man uh, now they need to bring back team spirit and game gallery and i'm you know just like bring back all the mall like staples oh, let's bring go showbiz P- let's go showbiz pizza place let's just go all Come old on, school man. with our pizza joints yes, yes please Sharpie, when you hit the hot topic later in that ski mask and, 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 and stock and hat, make sure you get the uh, the, 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 the concert T-shirt to, to wear to the game tonight. I, I will do that. Guys, I appreciate it. This is, uh, you know, now that I get to see your lovely faces early in the morning, you're the, you're the first people I get to see. I don't know if that's a yeah. good or a bad thing. Congratulations. Uh, he's going to go right for the tequila here shortly. <laughs> Sharpie, take care. Have a good call. Appreciate you. Hey, thanks, guys. We didn't even we didn't even get to get into baseball. We're gonna have to get into baseball with Gary next year. They just started the first practice yesterday. Yeah, it was beautiful. It yeah. was good stuff. Cranack, enjoy oh, you your went? weekend. You too. I said, Oh, you oh, went? 
No, I, bet, uh, I had eyes there, so it's okay. okay. Right, or Elijah, good. be good. Enjoy the weekend. We'll be back at you Monday at 4 on Hale Varsity, presented by Currency. Thanks.